Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Sakaris. I am the Deputy Director of the UCLA Center for World Health, and we're uh, very pleased to present tonight's forum on tackling Zika virus. Uh, we actually hosted a similar event um, in this auditorium about 18 months ago on, uh, on the Ebola virus. And while uh, the Ebola situation in West Africa is largely under control, the uh, World Health Organization actually declared a couple of weeks ago the end of Ebola as a public health emergency of international concern. Um, there are still new cases, actually. There were two confirmed and three probable new cases of Ebola reported in March in, in southeastern Guinea. So aside from the appalling tragedy of over 11,000 deaths in that region, in which two in five people infected with Ebola died, uh, that outbreak dramatically underscored the shortcomings both of local healthcare infrastructure in the region but also uh, shortcomings in the global health response structures. The world attention is now turning to Zika virus. Zika was until very recently a little known virus believed to cause only mild symptoms, but um, it's now created global alarm as many children born to mothers infected with Zika have been born with profound birth defects. It's now also believed that Zika may be responsible for neurologic disease in adults as well. As Zika virus is spreading rapidly throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, it's believed it will only be a matter of time before it uh, becomes an issue in the United States. This evening's forum features three prominent UCLA faculty members, Tim Brewer, Karen Nielsen, and Neil Silverman, as well as Lorene Mascola, who we're pleased to have from the LA County Department of Public Health. We're also very fortunate to have with us Andrew Pollack from the New York Times, who will be moderating the panel session. Uh, we'd like to thank tonight's co-sponsors, the UCLA Center for Brazilian Studies, of which Dr. Nielsen is the director, as well as the Brazilian Student Association at UCLA, or BRASA. And I'm pleased to have two uh, BRASA members here this evening, Daniel Leventhal and Natalia Levy, who are going to come up and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, we just wanted to say that it's a distinct honor to put on this event with the UCLA Center for World Health. Uh, again, we are the Brazilian Student Association. I'm the founding former president. Uh, Natalia is the current president. Um, we found it very important um, and relevant to Brazil to put on an event regarding Zika, which is why we approached the people at the center. So thank you very much for coming. We hope you have an excellent time. So I'd like to welcome to the podium our first speaker, Dr. Tim Brewer. Uh, Dr. Brewer is a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the David Geffen School of Medicine here at UCLA. And he is also the Vice Provost of Interdisciplinary and Cross-Campus Affairs. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about uh, outbreaks in an interconnected world. Tim? Terrific. Uh, thank you, Greg. On behalf, uh, I'd like to thank the Student Association and the Center for inviting me. Now that Greg has got you sufficiently scared, my job is to try and damp that down a little bit. So let's start off with the fact that outbreaks happen, okay? We're talking about Zika today, but you can see we have outbreaks all the time. Right now, Zika's been reported in 64 countries and territories. We're going to hear from Karen and Neil about microcephaly and sort of why we're concerned about this. But this is not a new problem. Greg talked about Ebola that's still percolating along. If you follow Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, that's a case fatality rate of almost 40%. And the granddaddy of them all was H1N1 pandemic in 2009. It's estimated that 61 million Americans got infected by that virus. So whenever bad things happen, you gotta ask yourself why. And I hate to say this, but it's basically our fault, okay? And by us, I mean the collective we. What we do to the planet and the fact that there are so many of us and that we crowd together and that we have the capacity to move people and plants and animals and things around the world very rapidly means that things that we don't want to move, like diseases and vectors, move too. And so we will continue to have outbreaks. So don't be surprised if we're back here in two years and we're talking about another virus. All right, so let's talk about Zika. 
This is an arbovirus. That just means it's transmitted by a blood-sucking insect, okay? You need two things. You need an animal, a bird, a mammal, a reptile with a vertebra, and you need a blood sucker. And then the virus goes back and forth. That's all it is. Flaviviruses are a kind of arbovirus, and we're going to focus on them today because that's exactly what Zika is. It stands for yellow, the Latin for yellow. The yellow fever is sort of the prototype of this virus, but the granddaddy right now is actually dengue. It's estimated that one quarter of the entire world's population is at risk for dengue. There are probably 100 million cases of dengue every year. We're, we're going to hear a little bit from Lorraine about West Nile, which hit the United States in August of 1999, took off. And we're going to talk a little bit about chikungunya, just because it's such a cool name. <laughs> but it is also an arbovirus. It's not a flavivirus, OK? But it does overlap with, with the others uh, there. So this is a zoonosis. That means it's supposed to be in animals. And we think the reservoir naturally is non-human primates. We don't actually know that. But what happens is it's supposed to go from monkey to mosquito back to monkey. But what happened, at least in, 19, in um, 1952, 1953, 1954, is it got from monkeys into people. And unfortunately, like dengue, it now is cycling just in people. So people are now a reservoir for Zika, and that's how you get really explosive epidemics. We're going to talk a little bit about 80s mosquitoes because they're the big problem here. So this lady at the top, so, so these are females. I know they're females because they're, they're taking a blood meal. Male mosquitoes are vegetarians. <laughs> This is one of the few times where it's the female that causes all the problems, right? <laughs> so here we got on the top an African mosquito that was probably introduced into the New World with the African slave trade. And if you see that top graph over there, I don't know if we actually have a pointer. Maybe we do. Hang on one second. Yeah. So over here, all this black, this is where Zika took off in Brazil, okay? That's vector is packed right in there. And unfortunately, and we can talk about this in the question and answer period, this, this mosquito is very well adapted for living with humans. Down here is the East Asian tiger mosquitoes, Aedes allopithecus. Got introduced into the United States in 1986 through used tires. The key thing to know about this mosquito, it does not transmit these viruses as well as this one does but it does like cold weather better, so you can find it in more northern climates. And if we were to have a problem in the US, and Lorraine's going to talk to us about that, this is probably the mosquito that would be contributing to it more than Aedes aegypti. So how did Zika get where it got? Well, Zika started out in 1947 in Uganda in the Zika forest, hence the name Zika virus. And if you do surveys of people in Central Africa, up to 40% of the population can show immune responses to the virus. So this virus has probably been circulating there and in West Africa and Southeast Asia for some time. But something happened in 2007. And what happened was it somehow got onto the island of Yap, and we had an outbreak of what they thought initially was dengue, but turned out to be Zika. Almost Three quarters of the population got infected, but only 20% roughly had any symptoms. So nobody really cared about this virus because it didn't seem to be all that deadly. In 2013, it managed to get over here to the islands of the French Polynesia. So now instead of a population of 6,500, you're talking about a population of 270,000 people. We had 30,000 cases, about 11% of the population. And for the first time, we're seeing congenital malformations that Neil and Karen will talk more about. And we're seeing these neurologic problems that I'll touch on very briefly. But again, for the most part, a very mild infection. It then kind of bounces around the different islands out in the middle of the Pacific until 2015. And that's when all the problems happen. So remember from that earlier slide I showed you, this is just chock full of Aedes aegypti. So you have all the ingredients for a massive outbreak. 
You have millions of people. Brazil is 209 million people, big population, crowded together, susceptible. Nobody's seen this infection before and a competent vector. And that's exactly what you want if you want to create an outbreak. Nobody knows how it got into Brazil. We're blaming the Sprint Canoe Championships. That's probably unfair on our part. But they recognized in February was something was wrong. Highly effective system in Brazil. By March, they had identified that they had a new virus, Zika. In the course of 2015 on, we now have 42 countries that have mosquito-borne Zika transmission that never had Zika before 2015. We have six countries where there's been person-to-person -person transmission, including the United States, 13 with Guillain-Barre, and six with congenital malformation. So this has just blown off the map once it got to a place where you had a lot of vectors and a big susceptible population. So there is non-mosquito transmission. So there are seven cases documented so far of male to female, including at least one where the person had not yet developed symptoms of infection. Uh, intrauterine and peripartum, Neil and Karen are going to talk about one possible case of a monkey bite, two laboratory accidents, two blood transfusions, no documented breast milk transmission, but you can isolate the virus from breast milk, so it's probably only a matter of time, but this is all rounding error on the epidemic, okay? This is a mosquito-borne virus first and foremost. So what happens when you get Zika? For most people, the answer is actually nothing. So you get bitten by a mosquito, 80% probably won't get sick. If you do get sick, you're going to be sick for four to seven days. You might get a little rash, you might get some conjunctivitis, you might have a little bit of fever. And for the most part, it'll go away and you'll just be fine. All of the flaviviruses can cause neurologic disease. So it's not surprising that once we get enough Zika virus infections, we start to see some of these. So all of these things have been described, for example, with West Nile disease, Guillain-Barre, meningoencephalitis, myelitis, and congenital anomalies. So I'm going to talk briefly about Guillain-Barre. This is a neurological disease. It's a progressive paralysis. And first recognized in the French Polynesian outbreak, remember there were about 30,000 cases of Zika infection, 42 cases of Guillain-Barre. That works out to about 0.24 per thousand Zika infection. To put that in perspective, there's a well-known association between a bacterial <laughs> infection, Campylobacter jejuni, and Guillain-Barre, and it's kind of in the same ballpark range. So it's not like this is doing anything different than a lot of other infections we know are associated with Guillain-Barre. In this particular outbreak, 41 of 42 cases had evidence for recent Zika infection. Interestingly, no virus present. It was all serologically diagnosed. And the difference between some of the typical Guillain-Barre's we see are it seemed to come on fairly rapidly and progress fairly rapidly. No deaths so far. About uh, 19 cases, I think, ended up somewhere between 12 and 19 on, on ventilators, on breathing machines. But so far, everybody seems to be uh, at least partially recovering. Why this happens is not clear. So most of the time, when we see Guillain-Barre after infections, we think it's autoimmune. We think the immune system is attacking the neurons by mistake thinking that they're the pathogen, that does not seem to be the case in Zika. So, you know, we'll have to wait and find out what's going on. So how do we figure out if you have Zika? There are basically two ways you figure out if somebody has an infection. You look for the pathogen, or you look for the immune response to the pathogen, okay? And we do both with Zika. There are no FDA-approved tests for Zika right now, but the CDC on February 26 did release a immune-based test. So this is a serology test. You're looking for antibodies to the virus. They tend to show up in about seven days. The big problem here is they cross-react with flaviviruses like dengue. And everywhere there's Zika in the world, there's dengue. And so this could be a challenge. One of the ways you deal with it is you do fancier tests. I don't know, Lorraine can tell us if the the county public health department can do this, but certainly the CDC can. So one of the things you have to do is you have to like up your laboratory budget. 
How we're going to find it, though, is PCR, polymerase chain reaction. We're looking for the genome. We can do that by asking the question, is there a flavivirus? And then if we find a flavivirus, we look for Zika. The problem is most people seem to resolve their viremia within three to five days of getting sick. That's a very short time to find the virus, maybe around longer in urine, and one report of virus being isolated 62 days later in semen. There's no treatment, there's no vaccine. But what we do is we try to avoid aspirin, non-steroidals, because it can cause low platelet counts, increase your risk for bleeding. We just treat it symptomatically. If we look at other flaviviruses, we've actually had vaccines for them. Attenuated vaccines tend to be better at boosting the immune system, but they have more side effects. Inactivated vaccines tend to be safer, but not as good. And we've been working very hard to find vaccines for West Nile and dengue. There is a veterinary vaccine for West Nile, but no animal ones. Lots of cool different ways to try to create vaccines nowadays, which we can talk about in the, the uh, question and answer period. So this is, does anybody know what this is? Yes. All right, we've got to go fast. <laughs> Uh, I'll have to answer the question for you. Yellow jack, yellow fever. This is the building of the Panama Canal. We think this is a new problem. Between, 19, between 1881 and 1889, the French lost 22,000 workers, one-third of their workforce to yellow fever and um, malaria. The only reason the U.S. could build it is because we controlled the mosquitoes. That's what you got to do here. You can do that personally. You can do this community-based, and there are some very cool things you can do with the mosquitoes, which we can talk about in the question and answer period. How do we respond internationally? Mainly we panic, but what we're supposed to do <laughs> is we're supposed to actually use our international health regulations, which have been in place in 2007. They allow us to, cre uh, as occurred on February 1st, as Greg mentioned, institute a public health emergency of international concern. Why doesn't it work? Well, uh, first off, when do, when do we do that? We basically do it for these reasons, and Zika checks off about three of these five boxes. Why doesn't it work? Well, for one reason, the budget of WHO is about the budget of the Ronald Reagan Medical Center and UC Davis Medical Center combined, so it's about $4 billion a year. Most of that is actually for programs. It's not discretionary. We do not coordinate well. When we respond, we tend to respond with public health people and epidemiologists, people like me, but we actually need to really respond with everybody. We need to gauge society, and we have to actually put in those public health systems which weren't there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. So we're going to hold questions um, until the end of the discussion tonight. Our next speaker uh, I'd like to welcome up is Dr. Karen Nielsen. Dr. Nielsen is a professor of clinical pediatrics at UCLA, um, and she is also uh... <laughs> fancy, and she's also uh, the director of the Brazil Institute at UCLA. Karen. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. Um, this is from the Brazilian Ministry of Health. You actually can find the mosquito on their website. It's just to remind us how annoying these things are. Um, this is a headline from one of the main um, newspapers in Rio saying that microcephaly is epidemic. This is back in November 2015. The press was really actually ahead of some of the scientists saying that there was a problem. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Zika virus epidemic in Brazil. As uh, Tim very well uh, described, in early 2015, there were reports from the, the northeastern states of Brazil that there was a dengue-like illness um, in, in many patients. It was not like dengue. The fever was less intensive at all present. There was a pyrogenous rash associated with it. People thought originally that was uh, dengue, but then it was found out that this was Zika virus. The vi virus was iso isolated from the serum and urine of patients. It was 
identified by PCR, and then the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation described it in March 2015 that Zika virus had reached Brazil. And the virus was sequenced, and it was found that it had originated in the South Pacific. Um, I don't have a slide about this, but <laughs> here it is again. It is thought that um, there are two strains of virus. The African virus is slightly different from the Asian virus. So if you look at the genome of the virus and you sequence it completely, you can, you can see if the virus originated from Africa or if it originated from Asia. And the Brazilian strain of virus is the Asian strain. So um, there are several, three possibilities, major possibilities, of how this virus arrived in Brazil. The first, of course, is because of the World Cup championship. There were several people who came from the French Polynesia, from the South Pacific, to watch the event. And uh, there was this canoeing event held in Rio in August 2014. That is actually the, um, it was an advertisement for the canoeing event. And uh, these are the Polynesians invading Rio de Janeiro. Um, we, we didn't know that there would be Zika virus associated with this. And this championship happened actually at this lake here in Rio de Janeiro, and it was a, a popular event. But there is a paper in Science, and this is where science and soccer mix, actually. <laughs> it is thought that the Zika virus might have originated in Brazil a year before when you had the pre-qualifying games for the World Cup. This was the FIFA Confederations Cup, of which, of course, Brazil at this time, they did win. As you can see, Spain is in second place, Italy and Uruguay. And um, that is a graph, actually, from the science paper, just showing that based on the sequencing of the virus and the evolution of the virus and the way the epidemic struck, that potentially the virus was introduced in Brazil in 2013 during this epidemic instead of 2014. We'll never know for sure, but this is the hypothesis. So uh, Brazil has three epidemics going on. It's not only the Zika virus epidemic. There are three viruses and one mosquito. That's also the press from November when Zika was making a lot of press these days. Today, everyone talks about the politics and economics in Brazil, and actually Zika is not in their press so much. But the virus can actually harbor, uh, the mosquito can actually harbor all three viruses. Uh, chikungunya, as Tim described, is not a flavivirus, but C Zika and dengue are. And uh, Tim touched on this, but I just want to describe when it comes to Brazil, actually Osvaldo Cruz was responsible for the eradication of the vector of the Aedes aegypti in Brazil in the 1930s. And that's one of the reasons he became so famous. And this was, uh, for this reason, yellow fever disappeared from Rio de Janeiro. So there was very good vector control for many years in Brazil. But in the 1980s, 1990s, this, um, the vector came back and repopulated um, the south of Latin America and Brazil. And this is a slide we already had. These are just, uh, this is from the 2000s when there were major dengue epidemics. Rio would have a dengue, major dengue epidemic every summer. And these are just the counties in red where you have the mosquito. So, of course, the perfect storm that we were talking about. The virus comes in. And um, this is the periphery of Rio, the, what we call the Baixada Fluminense. There are about five million people who live there. This is a very impoverished area of Rio with open sewage, open water, uh, very hot, very warm, no air conditioning in most places. And so it's, people are crowded. And so in, in, these, in these situations, and this is actually the, the favela da Rocinha, which now we call it Comunidade, but in any case, you know, people are living in these conditions. Of course, you will have tires, you'll have potted plants, you'll have all the right conditions for, you know, um, for the virus, for the mosquito to deposit the eggs, for the larva to grow, for the mosquitoes to live, or live and procreate. Mosquitoes live for about 30 days. So this is, is, is the background of a whole situation. So um, the slide says, pregnant women and the fear of Zika. So um, it was described back in October, November, it was already described in the press that there was a surge of cases of microcephaly happening in Brazil. They were in the Northeast and they were now uh, reaching Rio de Janeiro. And microcephaly is a pretty significant diagnosis. Microcephaly, it, there isn't a gold standard for microcephaly. If you look it up, there are different definitions, but generally it's accepted that it's a, a head circumference below the third percentile for that baby's uh, weight and age. And certainly microcephaly happens because the brain doesn't develop. So in, in situations like this, you will have regions of the brain that will not develop or global atrophy. It has developed, but for some reason it has involuted. And so you'll have severe problems such as deafness, vision loss, uh, loss of cognition, the frontal cortex seems to be affected. So um, that is what we are talking about. 
And uh, as you can see, this is a slide from the, one of the review papers in the New England Journal showing how the head will not develop. And what we see here in blue is cases of Zika virus infection in Brazil uh, that were reported. And as you can see in bright red are the cases of microcephaly. And actually it goes down here to where Rio de Janeiro is. So um, first Zika is introduced and then you see a surge in the number of, of babies who are born with very small heads. And this is every single state in Brazil has now reported a, cases of, a case of microcephaly. And in red are the cities where cases have been identified, even in the south of Brazil, which is considerably cooler. Um, and there is also reports of cases. Having said that, dengue is, occurs nationwide. So wherever you have dengue, you could have Zika. So this is back to the press. They, back in November, the Ministry of Health in Brazil was saying that the link between Zika and microcephaly was highly probable. And uh, now we know that this, this is really a fact. Um, there's, this is a paper that came out in the New England Journal last week that reviewed the links with causality, causality so if you're looking at Zika and uh, microcephaly. And there's now a, a body of evidence that's pretty overwhelming that links the virus to congenital defects. One of these is, for instance, from our group uh, collaborators in Brazil, the virus has been sequenced, has been identified in the amniotic fluid of uh, women um, who have babies with microcephaly. The virus has been identified in, in aborted fetal tissue of um, fetuses that have, in patients who had Zika virus infection, went back to Slovenia in this situation. Um, she terminated the pregnancy because of uh, severe central nervous system problems in the, in the fetus. And the virus was identified in tissues in the brain. So that's a, that would prove a link. And then there's another case of a mother who was found to have the virus in her bloodstream for over 10 weeks. She was pregnant. She also came back. I, I believe she contracted the infection in Guatemala. She came back to the United States. She had a pregnancy termination. And the virus was also found in the fetus. So, um, and there are many other reports and publications uh, showing this. This was important because back in January, as you know, not so long ago, people were thinking that uh, the epidemic was caused maybe by pesticides and that there was uh, an exposure that was teratogenic in the environment and that this might be causing the microcephaly, the cases of microcephaly. But what we have seen is that microcephaly is not an isolated phenomenon. It's not the only thing that you will see with Zika virus. And here I'm going to talk about some of our preliminary findings, the study we published um, Recently, from our Rio de Janeiro cohort, I'm originally from Brazil. This is actually my medical school. And uh, these are two of my colleagues who are my contemporaries from medical school. We didn't go to the same school, but we used to uh, get together. And um, when Zika st uh, struck Rio, uh, we, we were, I was talking to my colleagues, and they're saying, we're seeing a lot of malformations. The ultrasounds are very abnormal. There's something really wrong with this. And um, it was carnival at the time in, in Brazil, and, and I asked my colleague, well, why don't you come over with your ultrasounds and your data, and we'll put together a data bank, and we'll analyze this data. She said, oh, I don't have any time. It's too many patients. We're overwhelmed. And I said, well, you're not going to work during carnival. He said, no, everything stops because it's Brazil. And so she came over, and um, um, the obstetrician who was working on this uh, sent us all the ultrasound images. We worked on the database. We put a database together. We had 88 patients at the time who had been screened for Zika virus infection as part of a dengue surveillance effort. And this is, um, my colleague is at the Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, the Fiocruz Institute, which is the major research um, institute in Brazil. And this is just to show Oswaldo Cruz and Carlos Chagas. And that's the three of us in Southern California. <laughs> Anyway, um, my colleague Patricia Brazil, she had been working on dengue surveillance efforts uh, for several years in Rio when she had a dengue cohort of mother-infant pairs that she had been following. And when the Zika epidemic became evident in Rio, she started, she transformed her cohort to start enrolling also uh, patients with Zika into this. And so um, at the time we, f we published our results, 88 women had been screened by PCR. Uh, for Zika virus, and at the present time, there are 356 women, pregnant women enrolled in this cohort in follow-up. So this is the paper we published, and, and the story is as follows. Um, these are women who, who had a rash within the last five days, and they, 
this is how you enter the cohort. So we don't know anything about asymptomatic infection. All the, our patients had a rash, so it's a symptom. So they come in, and one of the main reasons they went to fear cruise is because they want to know what their diagnosis is. Remember, Brazil is facing its worst economic crisis ever. It's very hard for you to find a get a Zika diagnosis. This test costs money. Most of the places don't run the PCR assays. Even here in the U.S., it's very hard to get it. So they would come in, and they would go into the clinics, and we are they are still seeing 15 to 20 women a week who come in with a suspicion of Zika or other arboviral infections. So they were screened either in the blood or urine for Zika virus by, by a PCR test. And we had 72 who were positive and 16 who were negative. Of these 72, two had first trimester um, abortions. Uh, 42 agreed to have ultrasounds to see how the babies were doing. And at the time the paper was written, eight deliveries had happened. Uh, we estimate that by the end of June we'll have 130 deliveries um, because we now have a much larger cohort. Uh, 28 women didn't want ultrasounds. They didn't know, they w did not want to know. And so we followed um, 78 um, pregnancies which were ongoing. So um, this is just the rash of Zika. You, if you, our, all, our, all our patients had a rash, so this is what we, we call a macular or macular papular rash. And you can see that if you press the, ranch, the rash will blanch and patients can have also uh, swelling of their feet. They can have the conjunctivitis. They can actually have lymph nodes that in increase. This one is behind the ears. And, um, you know, Zika in some situations is called Zika fever, but that's really the wrong name for that because um, we saw that only one-third or less of patients had a fever with Zika. And if they did have a fever, it was very, very, very low grade. And, and as uh, Tim said, the symptoms are fairly benign. Uh, the rash is itchy, so that's the sort of annoying, but most of the time people will be better within a week or less. In our cohort, um, most, patient, most, of, most of our patients would have this macular papular type of rash. The, almost 60% had conjunctivitis. Um, lymphadenopathy, which is your, your lymph nodes being increased in size, was common. And fever, as I said, only happened in about a third of patients. And um, patients came from all parts of Rio. This is actually a map of, Rio, of the state of Rio. They came from different areas. And, and patients of all gestational ages came. So as you can see here, this is um, a bar graph of the problems with infection. Um, the black bars are women who had abnormal ultrasounds, the 42 ultrasounds performed. And as you can see, you, we had abnormal ultrasounds as early as eight weeks, women infected at eight weeks of gestation, and women infected as late as 35 weeks. And this is in our paper, but it's just to say we saw a constellation of problems, uh, mainly central nervous system problems, but we had calcifications in the brain, which means that the, there's a lesion to the brain tissue. We saw babies that did not grow. We call in utero growth growth restriction, which is uh, consistent with other viral infections that cause uh, congenital anomalies. And most importantly, we saw two babies who died, mothers infected late in pregnancy, two stillbirths, which was something that was never described and continues to happen, maybe because of placental insufficiency, there was very little amniotic fluid. Just an example of calcifications. This is a macular lesion. Some of these babies are are almost blind when they're born. So in conclusion, Zika causes a lot of problems during pregnancy in, in our cohort and the women who had ultrasounds, one third of them had very abnormal ultrasounds with very serious problems. This is just for um, Laureen to describe, is Zika coming to the U.S.? The red areas are where um, the Aedes aegypti actually exists in the Gulf areas of the U.S. And just to finalize, this says that a mosquito is not stronger than a whole country. And you zap the mosquito. And these are my colleagues in Brazil uh, who I want to thank. We wouldn't be doing this without them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nielsen. I'd like to welcome to the podium our next speaker, Dr. Neil Silverman. Dr. Silverman is an obstetrician and gynecologist at the Center for Fetal Medicine and Women's Ultrasound. He's also a clinical professor of OB-GYN at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. And he's gonna speak with us about Zika pregnancy and pregnancy planning. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And thanks to all, um, thanks to uh, folks here for the invitation to speak at this conference. So 
the progression here has been a background on Zika and um, Dr. Nielsen's very important work in delineating the impact of Zika on fetuses and pregnant women. And I'm going to move toward dealing with pregnancy and GYN as well, although I don't do gynecology that much anymore. I think that when we talk about non-pregnant female patients, this is really something that has global, local and global impact in terms of what it means for women who do and do not want to be pregnant. So um, I'm a high-risk pregnancy doctor who also wears an infectious disease hat. So um, when I deal with pregnant women, Especially since early January, the question that I am getting more and more echoes, this being Los Angeles and Hollywood, uh, uh, a line that was repeated in a film from about 30 years ago, which many of you probably won't remember, which uh, kept asking, is it safe? And this is the question that those of us who deal in this area are getting on a daily basis from women who either want to get pregnant or who are pregnant is when is it safe for me to think about getting pregnant and when is it safe for, um, for women in general. So in terms of what we are dealing with here in the United States, I've summarized as of last week the uh, pregnancy statistics that we have from um, the CDC. And as Dr. Nielsen alluded to, it's only since the middle of January, and this is three months ago, that the CDC started to issue travel alerts to people who wanted to go to areas where this epidemic was being described. And not until the 19th of January that the first interim guidelines were issued by the CDC dealing with how to manage um, women and who, pregnant women. Initially, Testing for Zika exposure in women who had uh, travel exposures was only to women who were symptomatic. In early February, those guidelines were expanded to all pregnant women who had traveled to areas where Zika was being locally transmitted. And that is when the calls really exploded for those of us who deal with this because we were seeing, I will tell you, in our center from the middle of January through the middle of February, we saw almost 100 women um, who came to us with a recent early pregnancy travel exposure. As of the middle of April, the CDC has reported 31 pregnant travelers with confirmed Zika infection. So that's serologically um, the antibody testing that uh, has confirmed their infection. I emphasize here, as I emphasize to the women that we see in our office, that in the United States, in the states of the United States, this has all been travel-related exposure. There are no locally transmitted cases here in the United States. However, in the territories, primarily Puerto Rico, um, there have been 475 cases so far, and almost 60 of those have occurred in pregnant women. So this is something that we are dealing with on an increasing basis, and there have been no Zika-related hospitalizations or deaths seen in uh, any of the pregnant women who have been infected um, because this tends to be otherwise a fairly mild infection in those who are, um, who are symptomatic. This um, will just show where the infections have been reported here in the United States. Not surprisingly, I'm gonna make, see if I can, which button is this, the red one? Yeah, so, sorry, all right, so you can see that this is the area where Zika may be coming to. There have already been eight, uh, over 80 cases reported in Florida, um, 27 in Texas, New York, probably because of travel between um, Hispaniola and, um, and Puerto Rico in New York and we have uh, 29 cases reported as of last week um, in California, and about 450 cases reported in Puerto Rico. So, what got all the attention were all of these newborns in rural poor areas in Brazil being born with very abnormal looking heads. But that was really, as we've realized, and as Dr. Nielsen has alluded to, really the only apparent marker that was seen in newborns. Um, microcephaly, it was clear, became an early trigger to search for a Zika association, but what has become apparent is that microcephaly is really the end product of a spectrum 
of abnormal development in um, infected fetuses. Uh, in early January, there was a case, there were a small series of two early cases of Zika isolation from the amniotic fluid of fetuses um, who were diagnosed with microcephaly in utero. But those fetuses had more than just microcephaly. They had abnormalities in the white matter in their brain. They had calcifications, which is seen in other vir viral infections in pregnancy. Classically with cytomegalovirus or CMV, we know that like Zika, the earlier in pregnancy the infection occurs, the more severe the ultimate impact on uh, fetal and neonatal outcomes. And also uh, enlarged uh, lateral ventricles in the brain. But microcephaly is a very specific diagnosis. It's typically unusual as an isolated finding, and it's initially seen in newborns. So initially, microcephaly is a neonatal diagnosis, not really a fetal diagnosis. When we do ultrasounds and we make a diagnosis of microcephaly, the um, definitions and cutoffs for this diagnosis are actually evolving. It had been de uh, described as a circumference of the head of a fetus for a given gestational age at less than the third percentile, although uh, many authors are now using less than the first percentile or less than three standard deviations below the mean to increase the specificity of that diagnosis. And that's the diagnosis that has been accepted by the World Health Organization and by the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. Now, the World Health Organization has actually just recently, they held a summit in March and came up with some uh, statements, and they are making an argument for uh, describing a congenital Zika syndrome. So this is more than just microcephaly, but they have described all of the brain abnormalities that have been seen in fetuses that ultimately uh, evolve into microcephaly, as well as fetal growth restriction, as well as neurologic impact of abnormal brain development. There's a specific condition called arthrogryposis, where the, um, there are uh, congenital contractures and abnormality of, of limb movement and ultimately neonatal limb movement problems, which develops because the brain is abnormal. And arthrogryposis is now part of the proposed congenital Zika syndrome. And as Dr. Nielsen alluded to just last week, the CDC asserted that there was now sufficient evidence to establish Zika as a teratogenic agent by using established criteria for uh, naming teratogens. So these are some of the images that were reported. This is from the series um, by um, Oliveira. Um, and I'm, I know people are going to look at these. I'm going to walk you through some of these because these are some of the most impressive abnormal ultrasounds I have seen. So this is a, a prenatal ultrasound. These areas here are the lateral ventricles in the brain, which normally would be one-tenth of that diameter in, in a normal fetus. So these are massively dilated, massively enlarged lateral ventricles. And when they're that large, the working part of the brain, the cortex around the ventricles, is compressed, develops abnormally, and that is what helps contribute, sadly, to the poor brain function. Um, in this fetus, there were also calcifications in the lenses that were seen prenatally. This is from a, a series that was just published last week in the British Medical Journal, and these are newborn uh, MRIs, and I'm not an expert at reading MRIs, but basically what we see are these white areas in the brain that should not be there. We see a very significant smoothness of the um, upper sur outer surface of the brain. Normally when you think of a brain, it has all those corrugations and ridges in it. Well, those are essentially gone in these newborns. And if the brain isn't corrugating properly, that means that the cortex of the brain is not developing normally. Um, and you can see here that the brain is actually pulled away from the skull. So this head is overall small, but the brain itself is actually small within the skull. The next series of images are really quite disturbing. This is actually a, a newborn with very severe microcephaly. You can see that there's practically no forehead here. This is a profile. And the, the top of the head and the top of the brain have essentially been sloped off. Um, the ventricles are massively enlarged with calcifications along, but this is a, a very severe case of, of neonatal microcephaly. So um, 
The Society for uh, Maternal Fetal Medicine recently issued a statement on microcephaly helping those of us who deal with prenatal ultrasounds on a daily basis. Um, we use two standard deviations to trigger a look for additional abnormalities. So two, less than two standard deviations, if you think of your bell-shaped curve, is still gonna be way down here. That's not diagnosing microcephaly, but it should be a trigger either to refer to a specialist who does prenatal ultrasounds on a regular basis, or to look yourself for other things that could be associated with an evolving abnormal development pattern. Um, and it again recognizes that this is a spectrum of developmental disorders. Microcephaly, unfortunately, is actually fairly difficult to diagnose before 22 weeks, and uh, the option of not continuing a pregnancy in many cases is no longer there after 24 to 26 weeks. Um, if the exposure is very early, especially if the woman was symptomatic, we might actually see intracranial findings along that spectrum, along that pathway. Um, and if we were to use CMV as a model of early infection, it takes about six weeks from maternal infection to start seeing any evidence of intrauterine infection in a fetus after a maternal CMV infection. If a woman is diagnosed with um, serologic infection by Zika uh, prenatally, then we can offer her an amniocentesis as we can with CMV, and we can do that same PCR analysis looking for the virus in the, in the amniotic fluid because if the fetus is infected, it will shed virus into the urine, and since amniotic fluid is nothing more than fetal urine, we can do an amniocentesis, take some of the fluid off, and send it to the laboratory for direct viral analysis. But if the Zika serology returns negative in a woman who's had exposure, and a reasonably timed ultrasound after that um, um, exposure is essentially normal, then we don't really recommend following that woman and making her additionally nervous all through the pregnancy. So once we get someone who's had early exposure, negative serology, and get her to 22 to 24 weeks, current recommendations is that no additional surveillance is really warranted. So what do we tell our pregnant patients? Well, how much fetal risk is there if a woman has a confirmed infection? Well, based on current data, that range may be anywhere from 1 to 29 percent, unfortunately. I personally believe Dr. Nielsen's study because they looked prospectively at a cohort of women who were documented to be infected, and in that study, the risk was close to 30 percent. However, a, a recent study in The Lancet, which was retrospective and more an epidemiologic model than a prospective study, put the number at 1 percent. Um, despite the earlier reports, a later infection does not appear to exclude the risk of harm. The study from Brazil um, showed that there was a risk of stillbirth, um, even when women were infected late in pregnancy. And we aren't obviously counseling uh, pregnant women or women who are planning pregnancy to postpone travel to areas with active transmission. And there's currently no native infection in the United States, states but the concern is obviously raised as summer approaches for um, risk in the southeastern part of the U.S. and in Hawaii. And there's also concomitant concern about reproductive options across the United States. If you look at the map, the states that are limiting access to pregnancy termination are right along the Gulf. Florida, Mississippi, the, the states that are at greatest risk. How about male partners? We know that sexual transmission can occur. As it was stated, there have been seven confirmed cases, including one male-to-male uh, uh, -male transmission sexually that was just reported last weekend in the New England Journal. Um, and in this study that is in press coming out in May, there was a man who was found to have a virus present by PCR in his semen two months after his exposure, long after he had uh, cleared the virus from his bloodstream. So pregnant women whose male partners have or are at risk for Zika infection should be using condoms or abstaining. We let them use condoms because most of these guys are bigger than I am. Um, <laughs> abstaining from sexual in intercourse for the duration of the pregnancy. And um, so right now, the current uh, recommendations from the CDC have looked at some of the evidence and said, that women who have traveled to these areas should wait for at least eight weeks 
before attempting a pregnancy, and for their male partner, um, if they are not symptomatic, then they should wait for at least eight weeks. If they are symptomatic, they should wait for six months before attempting pregnancy. And in terms of additional impact on OBGYN care, it includes egg and sperm donors, so that donors are ineligible for six months if they were diagnosed with Zika in an area with active transmission or had sex with a male partner with either of those risks. That also applies to people who want to donate umbilical blood or store their umbilical blood or use placentas. These were issued, these guidelines were issued by the FDA in early March and affirmed by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. And blood donation is a real uh, issue because uh, uh, Zika has been reported to be transmitted by um, blood transfusion. It's had a major impact primarily in Puerto Rico. Um, local blood collections were stopped in early March, and there's now an investigational use of uh, Zika PCR test for blood products that just started early this month. But uh, the FDA is asking that people wait for at least four weeks after travel or symptoms before being considered as a blood donor. Um, we know that um, in the news, health officials in Latin America have counseled women not to get pregnant. In El Salvador, they said don't get pregnant until 2018. Other countries said two years. Well, you know, that would sort of make sense if people had the ability in those areas to not get pregnant. But we know that there are significant issues regarding the availability of contraception in these countries. and. Despite what Pope Francis said recently on his trip to Latin America, and we know that the church is very influential in Latin America, the laws are still in place. So contraception and abortion pills, the <clears throat> pills for medical abortion, continue to be confiscated all through Latin America. Um, in the United States, laws surrounding abortion vary widely, and in Florida and Texas, Abortion and fetal tissue research laws have recently been passed. So in Florida, not only can you not get an abortion, but if you even have a spontaneous miscarriage, you cannot have that tissue analyzed um, for research in Florida, Indiana, and a number of other states in the country. Now these are just uh, looking at abortion laws in Latin America. I think this is important from a non-obstetric point of view. There are only three places in Latin America, four places in Latin America, but one is US, um, where abortion is actually legal, and a number of countries where it's absolutely illegal for all circumstances, and all the other gray areas, it's essentially illegal with some exceptions, but mostly for rape or incest or maternal health, but rarely is it allowed for fetal abnormalities. In the United States, these orange um, across the map are states with either moderately or extremely restrictive laws against abortion. Um, and you can see that many of them are right around where those, right around the Zika belt in southeastern United States. And he, here are the states with restrictions on use of fetal tissue. We have written an editorial for the American Journal of Bioethics that's in press, it's gonna be published next month, uh, dealing with the moral and ethical inequalities um, regarding women who are caught in the midst of this epidemic. Um, and um, with that, I will finish up, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Silverman, that was really enlightening. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Lorraine Mascola from the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. She's the chief of the Acute Communicable Disease Control Program. And um, she's gonna talk to us a bit about what we might expect in the United States from Zika. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, and again, thank the organizers for inviting public health to be here at the table and also for the uh, Association of Brazilian Students for having this forum, because it is, there are a lot of questions and a lot of myths, and we're gonna talk about the role of public health in, in this crisis. Um, again, you know, I would like to provide an overview of what type of mosquitoes we have here in LA County and whether or not they have toes or not, 
is it OES or ES? Anyway, and um, you know, because we do have the vectors here in LA County uh, that can transmit Zika virus. Describe the current epidemiology and importance of Zika virus and other arboviral infections um, here in LA County and what we do to, to count them and do disease surveillance and understand the importance of early disease recognition of Zika if we do want to prevent any local transmission here in uh, LA County and describe prevention efforts briefly that have already been mentioned by some people. Here you can see on an updated map, again, the distribution of mosquitoes in the United States. Over here in blue on the left is the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which again is the most efficient vector for transmission of Zika, as well as dengue and chikungunya. So you can see here, you know, California is well represented. But then on the other right-hand side of the map, again, Aedes albopictus, which can also transmit Zika, but is not as efficient as um, Aedes aegypti, and you can see that, again, goes up into more other areas of the United States where, again, the temperatures are colder, but the, the, the vectors can survive. But again, I think the areas of real concern are going to be, in, as has been mentioned before, in the southeastern areas of Texas and Florida, where we've already seen in the past little transmission or little outbreaks of uh, local transmission of dengue and also chikungunya. So now you might want to say, well, where are these mosquitoes here in LA County that have been found that are um, in you know, my neck of the woods? So again, we have a really great system in LA County, and we've had it ever since I came on board in 1985 when we were looking for St. Louis encephalitis. We have uh, sentinel chickens that we bleed every week to see whether or not they have any antibodies to any of the viruses. We have mosquito pools. We, we used to look for dead birds to see what viruses were going around. And we have great mosquito abatement districts, which I'll discuss. So you can see here, looking at from 2015, on, the, on your right-hand side in red, are actually areas of town that we actually have found the Aedes aegypti mosquito. And then again, areas on the right-hand side are in blue where we've seen Aedes albopictus. So these mosquitoes are here. They're in our area. They're mostly in Southern California. And that's why it's going to be very important for us to have a plan with all of Southern California, which we're going to get together to discuss what are we going to do with respect to mosquito uh, abatement and or, you know, uh, whether or not we're going to look at aerial spraying or how well are we going to contain mosquitoes because we know it's very hard to contain and eliminate mosquitoes. Again, as I said, it's been said many times, you know, Zika has not been transmitted in the continental U.S. You know, from 2011 to 2014, in fact, we did see Zika uh, in returning travelers from areas with local transmission. As mentioned before, you know, the cases are, you know, increasing. Depending on what day you look at it, the numbers change. Seven sexually transmitted, again, one now male to male. The cases have been reported that have been in the U.S. territories and how many are pregnant. In California, there are 34 cases uh, and seven are in L.A. County. Those numbers will increase. Some are still being vetted. And again, you know, will imported cases result in virus introduction and local spread in the, some areas of the U.S. is what is the most concerning to us here. To date, I can tell you what's been happening with respect to how many people have been tested in L.A. County. So, so far we've had 500 specimens that have been submitted to us. Um, again, we in L.A. County, our public health lab does not do any testing. You know, that is still being vetted locally, and that's been a problem with respect to, you know, the CDC ramping up testing throughout, you know, different labs in the United States, much slower than with Ebola virus where we were able to test. It's not that easy to test when, you know, using these tests because it's hard to distinguish between other flaviviruses, you know, like dengue and chikungunya, and if you've been previously vaccinated against yellow fever fever or Japanese encephalitis. So we've had about 500 specimens that have been submitted to us. About most of them come from asymptomatic pregnant females, mostly from Dr. Silverman's practice. No. And um, we have had those seven positive results, one male, six females, and one pregnant woman that delivered a baby that so far to date looks normal. Um, the mean age of our cases are about 36 years, but they range from 10 to 65. So you might want to question why are 10-year-olds and 65-year-olds being tested when we're really worried about maternal uh, transmission. We have no control over that. We don't know how the tests are being prioritized um, with respect to what I would think would be hopefully just testing pregnant women. All of our cases have traveled to Central America, and all of them have been symptomatic. 
Um, we have had 225 negative Zika virus results, and we still have about 200 cases pending. So when you think about it, you know, seeing that most of our cases are coming in from pregnant women that are asymptomatic, and if you want to look at the lowest uh, possible, you know, combination of perhaps percentages, 1% of them, you would have to have 300 negative tests before we might find one woman that's asymptomatic that would be positive for Zika virus. And then again, whether or not that would result in an abnormal pregnancy, um, again, the percentages varying from 1% to 30%. So I think we're doing okay here in LA County. I don't know how many cases we're missing not getting tested, because as I said before, you know, a lot of people that just go back and forth across the border to Mexico don't think of that as maybe local travel. And right now we're pretty lucky when you look on the website for the Ministry of Health in Mexico, it looks like they have very few cases of Zika virus uh, in, you know, areas close to the United States and where most of their cases are occurring is closer to the Central American areas. But again, you know, their surveillance, how well they do surveillance is, you know, not... Um, as well vetted as it is here in the United States. So what do we actually do? We recommend that people get tested, like we said before, if they've traveled to affected countries, that they have symptoms that are consistent with Zika, that they have pregnant women, symptomatic or asymptomatic, and of course, any newborn that's born uh, with fetal microcephaly or intracranial calcification, where a mother has traveled to a, an affected country, we would like to test anybody, again, with Guillain-Barre syndrome, like we said before, that was mentioned eloquently doc by Dr. Brewer. There is an association how much higher the association is than when, with other bacterial or other viral insults, we don't know, but there is an association with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And right now, the tests are sent through a public health lab to the state. Now, the state does not do the PRNT test, which is the confirmatory test. It right now is just doing the IgM test. And again, all PCR testing does go through CDC. So you, you can see that, you know, unfortunately it takes a while, you know, from when the test gets sent to us to when the results are known to the submitter. And it, it can be anywhere from as short as two weeks to as long as about six to eight weeks. Again, we've tried to make it easy for doctors to, um, get tests, so there's on our website, you can go there to get forms to request testing and it tells you how you can submit the specimens you want tested. Um, again, timely diagnosis and reporting is really important for us, like with West Nile virus disease, to try and assess whether or not there could be any possibility of local transmission. If we ever did, you know, most of the people that we have found that are positive, the seven people, were not symptomatic at the time. They got their blood test drawn, which most likely meant they were not viremic because of the short window period. So again, that would not affect whether or not there would be local transmission. But if you did get a lot of people coming back with active infection, active uh, viremia, and you know, had the possibility of being bitten by one of our local Aedes aegypti mosquitoes that could turn around and bite someone else. You could have some local pockets of transmission, and how we would find that is a very interesting uh, conundrum, because again, would you just look for people with rash? Well, again, you know, the specificity of that would drive us crazy, looking for clusters of people with rash. Would we wait for we, till we saw clusters of microcephaly? Well, that's too late. So I mean, again, all of us in the United States are trying to think about how would we find out about clusters of local transmission of this disease that really is quite minor in its symptoms, except when it actually affects the unborn fetus. And again, we, we always want to hear about cases, again, to reiterate, you know, to prevent sexual transmission and discuss pregnancy options like Dr. Silverman uh, mentioned. So again, we have worked, all, you know, we've sent health alerts to all physicians in the county, in the hospitals, emergency rooms, working with the OBGYN societies, telling them how to uh, get testing and report disease um, to us here in LA County within two weeks of people's return. We interview the cases, obviously, we enter them into um, a registry, which right now is still in its, um, uh, I don't know, makeshift format. The CDC is still, you know, forming a pregnancy a registry in the United States of women who do deliver uh, babies um, that have Zika positive moms, and we're obviously working with the private medical provider for follow up for these infants, even if they appear normal at birth, as Dr. Silver mentioned, to get auditory and ophthalmic evaluations and perhaps look for any other form for us of the disease, because microcephaly is probably the ultimate tip of the iceberg. And obviously, we need to collaborate with our mosquito abatement districts, which we call affectionately our MADS, 
which are really, really important for uh, mosquito prevention in LA County. And here you can see the vector control agencies that actually protect the health of millions and have been doing it for many, many years. There are five of them. You know, there's Greater LA in the top. There's a little area down there below. That's the Compton area. There's the Antelope Valley Mosquito Abatement District in the top, uh, LA County um, Vector Control in West. And um, what, San Gabriel. San Gabriel is a really, really good a vector control agency. One of my friends runs that. No. But it's, a, you know, we really have dedicated people that are out there all the time doing mosquito trapping, looking for those areas where there's stagnant pools. You know, go, again, you know, for a mosquito to breed, all they need is a cap full of water. So, you know, it really is a hard task when you're trying to think about getting rid of standing water. Because when you think about your sprinkler heads, you know how sometimes there's a little bit of water accumulation there? How many have sprinklers that have a little water accumulation? Mosquitoes can breed there. So when you really say get rid of standing water, it's really pretty impossible a task. And, and the, um, so we really have to rely on them to do the big picture things, you know, where there's huge breeding grounds and mosquito whittier narrows. Every year has stagnant water. Every year we go out there. You know, we do larva Exciting. We do, again, you know, mosquito abatement in many different ways that you could go into and we can and ask questions on. But again, you know, we are very lucky here in Los Angeles County to have these mosquito abatement districts that have been working with us for, for years, you know, as I said before, since I came on board here in 1985, when we were looking at St. Louis encephalitis ramping up again with West Nile virus, which I'm gonna to just touch briefly about in one second, um, because that's the disease that we're seeing in LA County at this point in time, and people need to take that disease seriously. Again, some more outreach efforts, and um, again, we attended a Zika action plan a meeting at the Center for Disease Control that had the 23 states that really have the vector, Aedes aegypti vector, to discuss what type of plan we are going to have should the virus come into the U.S. And of course, that's the, the global prediction, you know, what's going to happen in the future and how are we going to prevent disease. And again, you know, using um, mosquito repellent is not as easy as using um, uh, sunscreen. I mean, how many here in the audience actually use mosquito repellent in the United States when they go outside at night? Nobody. We don't have the cues, you know, we don't have the visual cues, we don't have, you know, user-friendly products, we don't see mosquitoes, we don't get bit by mosquitoes, yet we do get mosquito-borne disease in LA County. So again, you know, some people will say, you know, the virus will continue to spread in areas with competent vectors, and we are one of those areas that has a competent vector. We'll think that transmission is going to increase in Central America and Mexico, which would be really um, scary for us because we're so close to people coming back and forth from Mexico. And already we have had spread in Puerto Rico on the Virgin Islands, and they're having a hard time keeping that under control. Again, travel associated cases, cases could introduce the virus into the United States. You know, there have been imported cases before of other diseases, dengue, chikungunya, then Florida, New York, and Hawaii, that they had clusters but they did not have ongoing transmission. So again, they, luckily with our disease surveillance for cases and our good control efforts and our culture, you know, here in the United States, we have air conditioning. Most places, you know, we have screens. We have a culture that, that favors not being bitten by mosquitoes and we usually have the financial advantage to do those things and that's what happens. So if we see a cluster, we have our mosquito abatement people go out there, get rid of all outstanding water. We, we interview the cases if they are in their viremic phase, we might stay to them to stay indoors for a week so they don't get bit by other mosquitoes. So we're hoping that if we do get a few cases like they had before in Florida and Hawaii and New York, that they'll just be that, there'll be a few cases and then we'll clamp down. On the other hand, if there's tons of people that do come back in that are viremic, it could overwhelm the system and then, okay. So again, the colder temperatures hopefully will interrupt and stop it. So. The, the bottom line is this is a very interesting model that dengue might be predictive. So from 2010 to 2014, there were 1.5 million cases of dengue you know, that were reported to PAHO, not worldwide, but just to PAHO. We only had 558 travel-related cases and 25 locally transmitted cases in the U.S. So again, you know, that would just show you if we had you know, 1.5 million cases, which I think they've already had in Brazil, you know, we might expect 558 travel-associated cases, which we've already met almost. And again, there might be some local transmission, but we don't see ongoing transmission. But there's always the need for pandemic potential. We need to 
have continued education of the public, not only for Zika, but for all arboviral diseases, and again, work with our mosquito abatement. We always get 15 to 20 cases of dengue reported every year from travel, 50 cases of chikungunya in 2015, but let's not forget about West Nile, where we had last year 300 cases with 24 deaths, and that's just less than 1% of all the cases, really, that, that occurred in LA County, because the neurologic cases are the ones that get reported to us, and that's less than 1% of all cases. We had over 230 30 hospitalizations. If anything, we've been seeing more and more cases of West Nile in the last three years, and we've already had positive mosquitoes in the Sun Valley area. So again, you know, i would be interesting to, to talk about what we think will happen with the virus here in the U.S., and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I'd like to invite our speakers to come up for our panel. Um, and I'd also like to invite up uh, Andrew Pollack, who uh, covers business and science of biotechnology for the New York Times. Uh, he's been at the New York Times for the last 16 years, working out of the Los Angeles Bureau. And we'll have about 10 minutes uh, for uh, questions with the panel, and then we'll have the last few minutes to open up questions to the audience. Thank you. Those were all very interesting speeches. I prepared a long list of questions. <laughs> As the speakers went through, I checked them all off. They're pretty much all been answered. Um, I would like to get, um, this was touched upon, but you know, you have the Olympics coming up. So let's say you're a pregnant woman or a woman interested in getting pregnant and you want to go to Rio for two weeks. Yeah, I mean, yes. what are the actual chances if you take sort of normal precautions or or even answer this for someone who lives there, what's the actual chance that you're gonna get bit by a Zika, that you're gonna get Zika to begin with? And then if you do get Zika, what's the chance that you're gonna have a baby with problems? That I think we heard is one to 30%, but what's the first number? What's the chance mm. you're actually gonna get Zika if you Spend time in Brazil. Well, I, I go to Rio all the time. You always get bitten um, by a mosquito. I mean, yeah, you always get bitten by a mosquito. I killed a mosquito in my car, um, which I actually gave to someone to extract the RNA to see if the virus. Was. <laughs> um, and it was in the 80s or 50s. So, you know, the mosquito is all over the place. You go see the mosquito. I mean, if you stay in air conditioned places, depending on where you are, you will not be bitten. It will be winter in Brazil, so um, depending on the temperature, you know, if, when the temperature drops, definitely, you know, you know, like the dengue epidemic that always happened in the summer and the spring, fall, but we have a warmer climate. It was still very warm in Brazil in April, which was unusual, so as long as there's activity, there is a chance. But I hear from my colleagues now that there's much more chikungunya than Zika in Rio right now, so... <laughs> You could get something else, but um, not Zika. But there, are, you know, you can you can never say there's no risk. Right. Right. And you know, if, <clears throat> I think if you go back to the outbreak in in the Pacific Islands, mm -hmm. we know that serologically, about seventy five <clears throat> percent of the population showed um, antibody evidence of infection. Only about twelve percent were cases ill, but when they did studies about 75% of the population had shown evidence of infection. So I think at least better than half of the people in an endemic area are going to be infected. Now, what's the likelihood if you go there for two weeks that you're going to be in that percentage? I don't know. I've never been a gambler. Um, <laughs> so I get these questions. I just, I, I told Dr. Vescala that... Um, I got two questions in the past week about pregnant women who wanted to travel to Zika endemic areas. One for her best friend's bachelorette party in a, an area of relatively low endemicity, and um, another who was going there for her wedding and was une unexpectedly pregnant within a month before her marriage. And she had a destination wedding planned somewhere in Mexico in a r relatively low-risk area. But I think the answer has to be Pregnancy has so much uncertainty to begin with that we have no control over. 
So why do you want to inject an additional degree of uncertainty that you can control? And that's sort of my stock answer these days. Okay, so it sounds like the odds are pretty high that you will get bitten mm -hmm. uh, if you stay any amount of time in those areas. Um, one question, uh, this I, I don't mean to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I have read some things, including um, maybe not the original UCLA genetic study, but an interpretation of it, that it's not actually sure that Aedes aegypti is the vector for this. They can't seem to isolate the virus in any mosquitoes or in Aedes aegypti. Does anyone know anything about that? Um, so if you look at an Aedes aegypti mosquito and you look for dengue, and I don't think anybody would argue that Aedes aegypti cannot transmit dengue, you'll find dengue in about 0.1% of mosquitoes. So that's pretty typical. Um, there are data now that they've isolated Zika from a variety of Aedes uh, vectors, Aedes polynesius, Aedes hensula, uh, but it's low. But that's actually not unusual for flaviviruses. Um, so the, they've done transmission uh, studies with Aedes aegypti where you take an infected animal, you let Aedes aegypti feed on it, and you see if it can infect a new animal. Because you have to remember, just because you can infect a, a mosquito with a virus doesn't mean the mosquito is actually serving as the vector of, of transmission. And again, that's, that's been shown too. So um, this is actually not that unusual for flaviviruses. We don't usually find that most mosquitoes are positive, but I think the evidence is pretty convincing from the 1950s onward that Aedes aegypti can transmit uh, Zika virus and probably is the primary vector. It is very hard to find a mosquito that's infected. In Brazil at the Vector Lab, they had uh, looked into 5,000 mosquitoes and they had not found one. I'm sorry. Is this on? What I was saying was that in the vector lab at, in Rio, they have looked at 5,000 uh, Aedes mosquitoes and they had not found the virus, but um, that is not unusual. Apparently that also happens. Dengue is a little easier to find in mosquitoes than, than Zika, and apparently there's a competition between different viruses and mosquitoes, so you're more likely to find Zika, uh, dengue as opposed to Zika. Uh, having said that, uh, the mosquitoes also live for a very short period of time in the wild, just 30 days. They, they harbor the virus for about 10 days. So that, that is apparently something that you see with many different arboviruses, so I agree. It, there's no other explanation. Okay. If, if I can, I, I think that the myths about this have really pr um, <clears throat> propagated. And there was actually a very nice article in the New York Times um, in the middle of February that sort of addressed the popular myths that have traveled, primarily the one about um, larvicides that were mm. being put into the water causing birth defects. The larvicide that's used is actually an analog of a mosquito hormone that only deals with male mosquitoes mm -hmm. and makes them sterile. And it's, as we know, it's the female yeah. mosquitoes that bite. And the same pesticide, the same agent has actually been in flea powder available in the United States since the 80s. And children have been going around crawling on floors with this powder for decades, and it hasn't caused abnormalities in them. And there was a doctor's group that was trying to perpetuate this myth that gave themselves a fancy sounding name that was, oh, doctors of the river or something. And I, you know, we've seen this happen before. You, you, get a, a myth mythologic cause, and you make yourself sound important, and it carries some weight for a while. We saw it happen, unfortunately, in South Africa, um, where the president who didn't believe that HIV mm. was the cause of AIDS got a very debunked scientist to lend credence to his misdirected theory. So I think that there are many myths out there, and, and it's very important to have the the background and the, the ability to push back on them. Okay. Um, let me ask you this, um, sort of an open-ended question, but um, I have a billion dollars in my pocket. I'm going to give it to you to 
help stave off any problems, both in the United States and as much as you can in the world. I mean, how and where would you spend it? I mean, do we pour it into Brazil to do vector control? Do we try mm. to develop a vaccine as quickly mm. as possible? I mean, what would be the, the best use of money right now? So that's actually not far off. The president, President Obama, asked Congress for $1.8 billion to um, fight Zika. Congress approved zero. And so what the president did is he took $600 million, uh, which was left over from the Ebola authorization in the previous year, and reallocated it for, for Zika. So a billion's not, not too far off of what what they're, what they're putting out there. The short answer is all of the above. It depends a little bit on what your goal is. If your goal is to protect pregnant women now, the only thing that's going to do that is vector control. Nothing else is going to protect people now except vector control. And so if, if that's your primary goal, that's what you've got to be focusing on. Uh, but obviously, we, there's a lot we need to learn about this virus. And as Karen mentioned, it's very difficult to do vector control in these, in these situations. Aedes aegypti is uniquely adapted for living with humans. And it's a day-biting uh, mosquito. So bed nets don't help you unless you spend your day walking around <laughs> under a bed net. That's not going to protect you from an Aedes aegypti. So, so we do have to do those other things. We do need to develop vaccines. We do need to understand the epidemiology better. We need to understand the risks, the kinds of studies that both Neil and Karen talked about. I think it's important to understand the immunity because um, maybe the reason there are less cases, slightly less cases in Brazil is because the population has been immunized by a natural infection. OK. Okay, sure. Um, maybe the reason why we're seeing a decline in cases in Brazil, it's not only because the weather is changing, but because the population has been naturally immunized by the infection, and potentially you could have long-lasting immunity, and if that is true, we could develop maybe passive antibody approaches that if someone is exposed to it, they could give a passive antibody and that could neutralize the virus. What is happening in Brazil right now, is especially people of higher socioeconomic status, if they're diagnosed with Zika, they interrupt their pregnancies, uh, you know, like an epidemic of premature babies before the, bar the, the baby gets sick or to avoid a stillbirth delivery. So things like that are happening, but I think, um, passive approaches, you know, it's not a vaccine, but that could be developed rather quickly as well, together with vector control. Thank you. So I think we'd like to spend the last few minutes um, taking some questions from the audience. I have a question to actually uh, several members of the panel. From the myth uh, extremes, to the statistics on uh, the other side, one percent or zero point uh, or two percent probabilities. There is a wide range, and uh, within that wide range, the, the subjects that are suffering at this moment, more than a thousand patients in Brazil, uh, they have a baby with severe hypocycle. But then those percentage of this need to happen. What is the actual boundary from the myth to the scientific statistics to produce some specific action, like uh, uh, Dr. Miller was saying, that uh, could produce results? Because that's what we're looking for now. We could study this forever, and we have been doing it pretty well, but we need results now. What is the, your assessment? I mean, I, I will just say, I think there's, that's a very good question. I mean, percentages don't matter if it's, you're the one that has the abnormal child. I, I think the, the only answer, unfortunately, at this point in the epidemic is pregnancy avoidance. Uh, 
which has been you know, discussed by Dr. Silverman, is not always easy to do or termination. I, you know, there are no good answers and there are no diagnostic tests to say who, when infected, will have an abnormal infant and when that's going to occur. So I, I think at this point in time, unfortunately, while we're working frantically to get two different types of vaccines, number one, they're talking about a live attenuated vaccine that would actually be given to preteens, let's say, before they were even in the pregnancy range, because live attenuated give you better results than killed vaccines. But obviously, if you wanted to vaccinate pregnant women or women that were near getting pregnant, you would use a killed vaccine. So there are discussions about two different vaccines, but the, Dr. Fauci from says, NIH says, you know, we're looking at two to 14 years, even though we do have some basis to build on with the West Nile virus vaccine that's already used in animals. But again, and all vaccines, as we know, take a while to get going. So I, I don't know if there's any good answer for you, but I do empathize with, with the problem that women are facing in these countries. Long-acting repellents work. I mean, the women in Brazil, they were not using long-acting repellents. They're using short-acting repellents. Mm. Actually, 40% of the women in our cohort did use repellents. But if there are some repellents that stay on for 10 hours, it's very warm climate, but if you wear long sleeves and you stay in air-conditioned places, that I have friends who are pregnant, and that's what they do in these situations. And unfortunately, Zika is really linked to the socioeconomic status, mm. although we didn't see it in our study. If you live in a very nice area in Ipanema and you're in the air condition and you have the breeze of the ocean, and you, you can, we see much more cases in the poorest areas of Rio as opposed to the wealthier areas. So I think there are... There are different um, approaches to it. And in the poorer areas, these women don't even have access to prenatal care and prenatal ultrasounds. So that's why these initial cases were in newborns, not prenatally diagnosed, because mm -hmm. these were women in poor rural areas who ultimately brought their newborns to the regional centers, and the pediatricians were the ones who recognized that this, right. this was a cluster. I think that um, all these things are important, but they're going to be incremental. I think that... Um, I, I really think it is incredibly important for women's reproductive rights and women's reproductive options to be militated for strongly. And um, that does not exist in Latin America very widely. And it is being chipped away at in our own country. And I think that we do not, this is something we need to do. Carol? Well, that's a real issue. Um, I mean, the whole case that's being debated or that was debated before the Supreme Court dealt with access to um, abortion clinics in the state of Texas. So all you have to do is eliminate 90% of them and still say, well, these women have access in this state because we have two <coughs> clinics in a state the size of Texas. So they can go to either, either one of those. And that's an impossibility for the majority of especially poorer women, they just can't do that. So we're very fortunate in a state like California, we have the ability to terminate pregnancies without cause, without you know, a, a true abnormality, up till 24 weeks. And we can go beyond that in the state of California if a lethal abnormality is, is diagnosed and it's confirmed by a second high-risk pregnancy doctor. So, um, so I, I will say that we have the ability to go beyond 24 weeks for lethal anomalies. But that is, you know, despite Roe v. Wade being a national, you know, a, a judgment by a national court, the states have chipped away at that with, with increasing numbers of restrictions. So the whole undue burden issue that was put into place with uh, Justice O'Connor when she was on the court has actually come back to bite us. So if we have time for one more question, and then if our experts are willing to, maybe they could be approached afterwards. But the, please. Okay, so 
question I have is, what is the sensitivity of sensitive partners in the Because that's hard work, which I guess is in some ways uh, in regard to diagnosing the COVID levels that you have potentially in the Well, two things. I mean, to diagnose microcephaly, we would use less than the first percentile, so less than th three standard deviations, and those tables have been distributed. So, this, so that is diagnostic of microcephaly. Now, even if a woman has exposure, um, we don't have studies to say, if you have a prenatal diagnosis of microcephaly, um, how many of those, and women has, have exposure and they don't have serology, how many of those kids will be affected? I don't have a number for that. However, those would be pregnancies in which we would offer an amniocentesis for diagnosis. I guess my, my question is a little personal. At what level would you say a woman would be able to suppose the cause of above the percentile of percentile? Would you say it's just not the truth? In fact, or not the yeah. truth? You know, microcephaly doesn't happen alone. Mm -hmm. What we saw in our paper, it was never alone in, in the ultrasounds that, that were done. Um, there's always either cerebral calcifications, ventricular megaly. Um, very commonly, we saw in utero growth restriction. These fetuses don't grow. And actually, we thought they had microcephaly because by ultrasound they did. But when they were born, they were totally proportional. They were small for gestational age. They had small heads, but their whole their body was small. So, so I think that microcephaly is just, will pick up maybe 10% of the cases of Zika because there will be other alterations that are not being identified. Having said that, we just started a prospective study of babies in Brazil. We're looking at their general movements. These are Zika-exposed babies. We had eight babies come, and they apparently were normal, but they were born to mothers with confirmed Zika infection. Six of the eight babies failed their first neurologic assessment. So I think things are not going to be worse than we expect because microcephaly is just one little component, you know, very obvious component, but it's probably not the most prominent finding. So you've been using the third No. No. No, and, and I, I would just emphasize Karen's point that we, we rarely, if ever, make a prenatal diagnosis of microcephaly in the absence of other ultrasound findings. You don't have a perfectly normal brain that is only the first percentile. You know, a first percentile head with a perfectly normal brain. It just doesn't happen. Well, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. We'll give a big round of applause for the panel. Great seeing you again. Good to see you.